let's just start now. So um, up next we have, so Vincent, you're going to go for part of the time and then you're going to switch to Matthew or? Yep, that's right. Uh, Vincent Wang and uh, Matthew Wilson talking about the safari of update structures. So take it away. Um, hi everyone. So I'm going to tell you a bit about update structures, which are this thing that we've been looking into. And uh, I want to give you some history and some intuitions uh, because it, they're really fun to play with. And then Matthew will tell you about the sort of cool story that we found with update structures and uh, categorical quantum mechanics. And um, if you have any questions that you can type in the chat, James and Guillaume are on duty. So they'll try to answer your questions in the Zoom chat if you have any. Um, so let's begin. So the initial problem was one of semantic engineering. The motivating example was this sort of toy problem where you have some text that's telling you that say Bob is an animal and Bob's a chameleon. And the notable thing about chameleons is that they can change color. So you can at some point read that say, oh, well, this chameleon is red. And then at some point later on, you might be told that the chameleon is green. Like this. And the, the problem here is to sort of model the, the listener's model when a chameleon is said to change color. So there's this dynamic epistemic thing going on. So the setting we were working in was a monoidal setting. And we wanted something to capture this notion of what it means to update the meaning of something. And ideally, we would also have uh, sort of graphical laws that we could manipulate to, to eventually you know, work, work this stuff out just on, on pen and paper. Um, so these were some of the original notes that, that like spurred on this problem from, uh, from a, a, the beginning of this year. <clears throat> so our idea was, okay, well, let's, let's pretend we know nothing, which was easy enough for us to do. And then let's try to capture the intention of what we mean by an update structure in the most general terms. Um, and it was lucky that we pretended we knew nothing because if we just assumed lenses from the get-go, then we wouldn't get here. So our idea was let's characterize an update structure by what you can do with it. So, you know, what stuff it has, what processes it has between those stuff, and uh, how those processes interact. And the natural thing that you might want to start with in a monoidal setting is you say, well, okay, maybe I have this updating thing that takes a system and a property and then kind of stuffs the property into the system. And once you've stuffed the property into the system, you might want to get it out again at some point. So we thought, well, let's have also this view process that takes a system and sort of pipes out the property again and, and keeps your system into, and you know, has a, another system coming out. Um, and so now we're thinking, okay, well, how do these things interact? Well, what happens if you say update something twice? Well, okay, here's an example of update and we'll try to go for the most general graphical rule. Say that, say that your system is a bucket of paint that you're churning and say that your property is some color of paint in some quantity and say that your update is you're just pouring in some paint, you're mixing in some paint into this churning bucket. So what's the most general kind of graphical rule that you'd want to like capture the system? Well, in the case of mixing paint, all you need to have is a kind of binary operation on the property, which is color and quantity, that tells you what color you get out in what quantity when you mix two, two components of paint together. So we thought, okay, well, let, let's say, let's say, well, this is looking kind of lens-like at this point. So let's, let's say that we've got that, if you do an update twice, you kind of get this magma over here. And a reminder is, uh, a magma is just a binary, an algebraic binary operation. Uh, you don't know if it's associative. You don't know if it's unital. All you know, it's a binary operation. We thought, okay, well, that seems general enough. Then we thought, okay, what happens if you, uh, what happens if you try to get something twice? So what's the get get law over here? Well, okay, so here's an example. So let's say that the, the system is a vinyl and let's say that the property is some music that's on the vinyl. Let's say that the get in this case is you're just playing the vinyl on a, uh, a vinyl player. And it's a fact about vinyl players that every needle is gonna damage the vinyl. It's going to uh, flatten out the grooves and make the tune not groovy anymore. So 
what you've got is this notion of, well, okay, if I, if I play this vinyl repeatedly, then at, at some point it could degrade and it might not be the same anymore. So maybe instead of taking, uh, taking this view that, well, if we look at something twice, it might just be the same both times and we might want a copy over there, we'll say, well, in general, we might want this co-magma structure. And indeed, so our get-get kind of ended up shaping up like this. And we thought, okay, this looks pretty general. At this point, we took a step back and we realized, okay, so what we're describing at the moment here is some interacting modules. We've got an interacting uh, magma module and we've got an interacting co-magma module. And the last step for us was to think, okay, well, now that we have this as a sort of basic building block and this is the, these are all the elements of, a, of an update system, the remainder is to kind of determine how the puts and gets interact with each other. And in the first paper that we wrote together, this is, this was sort of, these were sort of the laws that we settled on. Um, so for our put get, our operational reading was, okay, well, we're kind of thinking of systems that behave lens-like, but in a monoidal setting. And so we wanna, we wanna say that this co-magma is really behaving like copy in a way. And the operational intuition of, of put get in our case is, well, if you, if you update something and you get it, that ought to be the same as just making a copy of the property you were intending to update with. Uh, updating into one copy and then just piping out the other copy and then taking a look at that. And our get put is sort of saying that our memory system is faithful in a way and saying that, well, okay, if you, if you take a look at it and you put it back in, no harm done. You know, you're not taking the cookie out of the jar and eating it. You're just looking at it and putting it back. Um, and so all of that was really a convenient excuse to write a, a paper about like uh, categories of semantic concepts where we could use emojis as variable names. Um, and that was the sort of, culmination of one aspect of, of the story of uh, update structures as we came up with them. So we looked at these things in a bit more detail and we thought, okay, well, there's some, there's some relation going on here to the lens story or the very well-behaved lens story. Because um, if you know about very well-behaved lenses, you kind of have this functional reading that a very well-behaved lens has a sort of state and a view. And the state is really behaving as a box where you could put exactly one instance of the view and uh, your update really behaves like overwriting and your get really behaves like, well, you know, throw away the box, you know, show me what's inside and just, uh, and uh, we thought, well, okay, if that story works out intuitively, it should also work out formally. And so one of the things we showed is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in Cartesian monoidal categories with uh, the terminal object as the tensor unit between uh, very well-behaved lenses. And these are uh, set-like, these are, these are set-based uh, very well-behaved lenses and the update structures as we've defined them with these rules. And you can kind of see the, you can kind of see what the correspondence is. You just say, well, above here, the, the top row here are the lens laws written graphically. And sort of the one-to-one -one correspondence kind of follows. That's the mix operation that you want. That's the magma, which is the left elite. And uh, the modification that you make to the get our get is you kind of delete one side and you box that off and that'll be your get. And if you have a get from a very well-behaved lens, you can sort of box that all together and that resulting thing is gonna be a get of this form. So we showed that there's this nice one-to-one -one correspondence and that indeed we've achieved some kind of general, some sort of a generality, uh, uh, some generalization of lenses into the monoidal setting. Um, and Another thing that we noticed early on is that these update structures that we're playing with looked kind of like quantum operators. I mean, suppose that the system's a quantum system and the property is some classical data, then your put starts looking a lot like a controlled unitary, your get starts looking like a Von Neumann measurement. So we wanted to know what was the relation of update structures to categorical quantum mechanics. And that's the other story that we explored in this paper. And that's where I'll hand over to Matt. Hello. Oh, great. I'll uh, just share my screen here. Yeah?
Okay, we all good? Looks good. Awesome. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so Vincent just introduced uh, the axioms that we had for an update structure, uh, trying to capture the idea of what it means to, to have a property living inside the system. Um, now, as Vincent also said, a lot of this stuff feels a lot like the kind of story of quantum measurements. Um, however, with quantum measurements, if, you, if you're asking for kind of like classical agents to interact with quantum systems, then this kind of idea of taking the cookie out of the cookie jar and putting it back in and, ask, and hoping that nothing happens, kind of, uh, this is not a nice story. Usually when classical agents interact with quantum systems, they cause some kind of disturbance. So this get put rule, uh, we decided probably needed to go. Well, it did need to go. Um, so we are interested in general in weakening this get put rule to allow for kind of interactions to have disturbing effects on systems. Um, we are interested in what kinds of update structures we could build kind of in quantum settings. So in places like FHILB and CPM of FHILB. Um, and we were we wanted to come up with various examples of update structures, but we wanted to be lazy. Um, we wanted to come up with some and have some general rules for how we can build new update structures from old ones. Um, and so that's roughly what I'm going to mention in this section. So first of all, what's wrong with this get put um, axiom? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. But again, if you have a classical agent interacting with a quantum system, um, essentially, there are natural situations in which you're asking for a property that a system doesn't have. So it's true that, that we imagine that if we ask whether a system has a particular property uh, and put that property back in, uh, if it had that property, this should do nothing. But if, we, if the kind of thing we're doing is asking for a property, like asking whether it, it's in the state zero or one, then this will collapse the system. Um, so we need a kind of slightly weaker axiom to capture that sort of situation. What we came up with was a repeat update axiom. So get put says, if I update a system with a property it has, that should do nothing. All we need to do is make sure that the system really has a property. So the weakening that we came up with was to say, okay, well, if we take some property that we want to update a system with, and we update it with that property twice. So we make a copy of that property and we update with it. And then we update with it again that should be the same as just updating with the property once. So once we're guaranteed that a system has a property, giving it that property again does nothing. So intuitively, this has a really similar sentence, like in terms of like kind of semantic engineering style thing, sentence feels similar. Um, formally, um, they are related as well. Formally, we're calling one a strong update structure and one a weak update structure. And that is because in the presence of the other axioms of an update structure, uh, any strong update structure is a weak one. If you have get put being identity, then this repeating updates axiom is immediately true. So this is a formal weakening um, that captures the same kind of sentence. And we wanted to make sure this kind of story made sense by having a sensible condition for when one of these weak update structures actually was strong. And the idea was, well, weak update structures should be strong when interaction doesn't do something to the system. Well, if interaction doesn't, well, one way of capturing that is looking for a state that we can update the system with so that the update actually does nothing, just does the identity. This would be a kind of way of saying it's possible to interact this, with the system without kicking it into some smaller subspace. Uh, and indeed, if we do have such a state, then any weak update structure with such a state will actually be a strong update structure. So the story kind of pans out in terms of the words that you would want to give to the maths um, checks out formally. Um, so then we're interested in kind of ways of generating examples of these sorts of things. Um, and one thing we wanted to do was to come up with a way of generating weak update structures from strong ones. And essentially, this is the method that was used for um, generating quantum measurements in um, 
uh, paper uh, quantum measurements without sums, which I wish I'd gotten this, the citation for. Um, maybe we'll drop it in the chat afterwards. So in general, we showed that if you apply a decoherence-like morphism, we kept it as general as possible, uh, to, a, to all of the property wires of a strong update structure. So we take a morphism here that behaves a bit like decoherence. We apply it to all of the properties that we can find. Then this generates a new update structure, but a weak one. Essentially, this is kind of a, a mechanism for um, allowing for measurements to suddenly kick back onto systems. Um, and so this is the way in which quantum measurements are built from projective valued spectra, but we found that there was other types of update structures that we could also decohere in this way. So we came up with a few examples. Uh, and there's kind of two natural flavors of examples. One is a kind of restriction flavor of update and one is a kind of replacement flavor. So the restriction flavor of update consists of asking for any update that I put into a system to correspond to applying some kind of projection to the system. So we're imagining we're, for example, in somewhere like F -Hilp. Um So any update restricts the system to some smaller space and the measurement consists of reading out what space the system lives in, for example. So we can imagine this sort of update. We can also imagine something more like one of these very well-behaved lengths, where rather than kind of registering what was coming in before and compressing it into something smaller, we just chuck it away and we replace it with some new state. So this is a very different flavor of update structure. Um, let's just call this a kind of replacement. Uh, now, we showed that um, this theorem that we had for decoherence applies for both of these. So we were able to write down update structures of either flavor, and we were able to decohere both of them to generate weaker ones, ones which disturb systems. So uh, in each of these cases, yeah, so this one's weak. This one, I should also mention, is weak. And in each case here, um, the readout procedure, rather than being this kind of coherent readout of the subspace where something lives, is a, it's instead a quantum measurement. So here, and this get procedure here was also a quantum measurement. So we had a, we were able to generate a few examples already of update structures and two kind of flavors of them. Um, and we we're wondering as well if there was a way to go the other way. Can we start with a weak update structure and get something strong? Because morally here, there is some kind of subspace of the system on which we should have a strong update structure. There are pre-decohered systems. The systems which are already decohered, if we extract information from those and put them back in, that should do nothing. Um, so we showed in a previous paper a kind of a very general version of being able to do this sort of thing. We showed that from any weak update structure, you can build a strong update structure in a new category on a kind of updated type. Um, so I just have to move my zoom window a bit here. There we go, cool. Um, so we showed that uh, given any weak update structure, we can construct new stronger update structures where all the states are those which are consistent with having already been updated. So in the quantum setting, this is things which have already been partially dego hit. Uh, but we found other uses for this in natural language processing as well. Good. Um, so this was just the formal expression of the construction that we came up with for uh, building from weak update str structures, strong ones. It essentially consists of updating everything on every wire already, Pl applying, getting, and putting to every wire every system wire, that is. Um, so we've got these transformations. We've got a way of going from strong updates to weak updates, a way from, of going from weak updates to strong updates. Uh, we've got a reason, uh, a kind of intuition for when we should care about weak updates rather than strong ones. Um, uh, and we have some examples. Um, so in terms of the outlook, what we're interested in the future, um, there's a few sensible ways, or there's a few possibly sensible ways of composing update structures. Uh, so we're interested in the kind of conditions needed to compose them uh, and what the most sensible ways are to compose them. 
Uh, we're interested in coming up with some more examples in natural language processing contexts. And also we, we kind of, we had some of this success with translating the words that we wanted to say into formal maths. Uh, we're interested in how far we can go with this in making zoos of update structures, which say the various sentences we'd like to say, and we'd like to know which ones are stronger than others uh, and so on. So yeah, that's all. Thanks very much. Excellent. That was impeccably timed, guys, and great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have about five minutes for questions. Um, people can unmute themselves, as you just heard. Any questions out there? Um, I guess I guess I can ask a question. I didn't understand the relationship between your notion of decoherence and I guess the somewhat standard one from quantum information theory. Can you say something about that? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of, so of course, uh, decoherent morphisms are always uh, idempotent. So essentially, we were looking at a kind of more general version here and, and, and the problem we had is we didn't want to assume anything about these mixes and um, these magmas and co-magmas off the bat. Um, so, but this is a generalization of a statement about the decoherence morphism from a particular Frobenius algebra on the magma and co-magma for that Frobenius algebra. So, these are some conditions that the decoherence morphism would satisfy in the following sense. So if I took the magma to be the kind of copy map in a, for a particular Frobenius algebra embedded into uh, CPM of F Hilb, then this morphism M indeed satisfies this condition. This is essentially just like spider fusion. So we, 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 we just wanted to capture the minimal things possible about this decoherence map uh, that we need to have a genuine transformation between update structures. And the reason for that is because in this very well behaved case here, we're not dealing with a normal Frobenius co-magma. We're dealing with a co-magma which deletes what came before and replaces it with something new. Uh, and so we wanted to shoehorn both of those and whatever extra stuff there is into one, one kind of uh, more general proposition. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Hmm. So um, this, what you're presenting, of course, it's more general than that, but it, you could look at it like a, some kind of calculus for uh, properties of quantum systems, right? But it doesn't express all of the possible behaviors of a quantum system, right? I mean, uh, 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 the question is, how does it, how, how would you go about thinking about completeness in relation to quantum systems? I see. Uh, as in, so this, uh, let me see if I understand the question. Um, so, so as in, uh, th th there's only limited things that I can I can use the calculus we have so far to to prove about quantum systems, and how could I start like adding more rules to it to to make it more expressive? Is that kind of the yeah, question? I mean, I mean, uh, in principle, every unitary transformation mm -hmm. is a valid transformation of a quantum system, but you can't express every unitary transformation. Actually, you're a, you're a, it's more of a calculus of measurements, right? Mm, yeah. You could expand it to have, um, I mean, uh, unitary transformations and it would be a framework for, I don't know, quantum computation or something. Right, yeah. And there's, so th th there's a thing here as well about checking um, whether you can do various things because uh, what we are dealing with here was like controlled projections, right? Um, not sure off the bat how many of, these things check out for like controlled unit trees instead. Uh, probably all does check out. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe drop a note on the chat. Yeah. 
Great, so I'm gonna just cut in. Um, thanks for the questions, everyone. So this ends the first session.